With the advent of the steam engine, ocean travel was revolutionized. Crossings which once took months could now be completed in weeks, and as technology continued to improve, the race to see who could make the fastest time was on. Nowhere in the world was this competition more fierce than on the North Atlantic run between Europe and America. Initially, the primary objective was the transportation of mail across the cold waters, but as the U.S. began to relax immigration restriction laws, the focus of the shipping companies shifted from parcels to passengers. The great ocean liners were born out of this rise in immigration, and the lines that operated them competed not only to offer the most comfortable crossing, but also the fastest. Quickly, the companies realized that the larger and faster ships meant more immigrants could be transported swiftly across the Atlantic. The race thus intensified, with lines looking to build larger ships, outdoing their competitors. Having a long-standing history of seafarers, British shipping lines had held the lead for the majority of the race's history by the end of the 19th century. On the horizon, however, was another country that was bent on becoming a great maritime power, Imperial Germany. The Kaiser's naval ambitions extended beyond a desire to see his fleet grow, but also to build grand ocean liners that would serve as symbols of the might and power of Germany abroad. Encouraging German lines to build larger and faster ships, these efforts finally culminated in the SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse, the first ship in the world to be dubbed a superliner. Debuting in 1897, her enormous size and four funnels left contemporaries looking tiny in comparison, and set the trend for the future of the ocean liner. Even more impressive was her speed. Making over 20 knots, she handily broke the previous record holder's time across the Atlantic, snatching the coveted blue riband from the British, who had held the honorary title since 1856. Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse was instantly popular and attracted the lion's share of the passenger trade. She would be followed by three near sisters, all of whom were renowned for their speed and luxury. The British were apoplectic, infuriated that a country that had not even existed for 50 years was besting them on the waves, they were determined to strike back. Despite this desire to take back what they saw as theirs, Britain's merchant maritime sword was being blunted by American money. The notorious J.P. Morgan had begun buying up major shipping lines in Britain, hoping to secure a monopoly on the Atlantic the same way he had done with railways in the U.S. The German lines had negotiated a deal with Morgan to guarantee autonomy, and so now the British faced the prospect of losing some of their greatest shipping lines to either Morgan or financial ruin. This troubled British Admiralty significantly, as they had long been able to call on the line's maritime fleets as auxiliary forces in wartime. Using the ocean liners as transports, hospital ships, and merchant raiders, the British were understandably concerned about being unable to utilize this force in the event of war. One line that was especially feeling the pinch was Cunard. With a long naval history in Britain and many blue riband holders to their name, Chairman Lord Inverclyde was worried about the prospect of being bought out by Morgan. Recognizing that he needed a miracle to save his company, he went to Parliament asking for financial aid to build new ships to challenge the German threat. Concerned not only with the loss of national pride that would come about from the American takeover, but also the possible naval vulnerability the situation posed, Parliament agreed to fund two ships for Cunard, lending them £2.6 million that was to be repaid over 20 years with an interest rate of 2.75%. There would be one more request the government would make of Cunard in regards to these ships. They asked that both be built to admiralty specifications in order to be used in wartime as armed merchant cruisers. The ships would be the largest ever designed and required extremely powerful engines to not only meet the demands of Cunard, but also of admiralty. It was here that they became test beds for new technology when it was proposed that they be fitted with the brand new steam turbine engine. Charles Parsons had been gradually increasing his product's use in the Royal Navy and promised not only higher speed, but less vibration and greater fuel economy. To test his claims, Cunard fitted steam turbines to a liner already under construction, RMS Carmania. Parsons' claims were validated when Carmania made an extra 1.5 knots on trials than her sister, with the ship also being more fuel efficient and comfortable. Planning their two new liners, Cunard still had several demands from Admiralty to meet. Among the changes were a widened beam for greater stability an adjustment to the rudder arrangement for greater maneuverability, and a requirement that all machinery be placed below the waterline. Coal bunkers were situated longitudinally along the sides of the ships, a common practice in cruiser design at the start of the 20th century. High tensile steel would be used in the construction, uncommon in ocean liners. To Cunard, however, these ships were to be luxurious profit makers, not warships. 
and once Admiralty had been satisfied, they then went about making them such. The new ocean liners were to have the most lavish appointments in the world, and their names were to reflect Cunard's traditions. The first ship, being built by the John Brown shipyard in Scotland, would be named Lusitania. Her sister, Mauritania, was built by Swan Hunter in England, reflecting Cunard's tradition of having near sister ships being built by competitive yards. There were some minor differences between the two. Mauritania was five feet longer than Lusitania, and used a different style of ventilator on her boat decks to bring air to the boilers. Aside from these and other minor dissimilarities, the two ships were very much the same. Lusitania was laid down in 1904 and launched two years later in 1906. Sadly, Lord Inverclyde would not live to see his dream realized, passing away in 1905. His widow christened Lusitania. The great ship finally got the chance to prove her speed in 1907. On trials, she managed to exceed 26 knots, which was a source of great satisfaction for Cunard, the Admiralty, and John Brown shipyards. This came at a price, however, as the stern section of the ship vibrated excessively, making some cabins uninhabitable. After struts and supports were put in place to try and curb the degree to which the hull rattled, Lusitania was ready for her maiden voyage. She missed the Blue Ribbon record by only 30 minutes, giving an impressive showing up for her first crossing. This shortcoming had been caused by a fog that forced the ship to slow down and the fact that her engines still had yet to be thoroughly run in. On her second westbound trip, she finally snatched the prize from her German rivals, averaging 23.99 knots and making the trip in four days, 19 hours, and 52 minutes. Lusitania would continue to beat her own record repeatedly, making her best westbound time in 1909, completing the journey in three hours less time than her first record-setting voyage, averaging an incredible 25.65 knots. When her sister Mauritania entered service, she proved to be even faster, stealing the prized blue ribbon from Lusitania. This interline rivalry was a source of fascination to the public, with many loyally sailing with only one of the two sisters. During her career, Lusitania would transport over 260,000 passengers, and was widely regarded as not only luxurious, but safe and reliable. When war broke out in 1914, Lusitania quickly sailed back to Britain from America, and was repainted gray in effort to conceal the ship. She was placed on the official list of active armed merchant cruisers, but would not see service in this capacity. Rather, Admiralty instead focused on Mauritania and the newer Aquitania, allowing Cunard to keep Lusitania on the North Atlantic run. Repainted in her line's livery, Lusitania once again brought people back and forth. Far fewer passengers made the crossing, however, than in pre-war, and Cunard ordered one of her boiler rooms to be shut down to make the liner more cost-effective. This reduced the ship's top speed from 25 to 21 knots, a significant drop-off. All the same, she was still fast enough to outrun most threats to her. Additionally, Lusitania flew the flag of the still neutral United States, something that combined with American passengers aboard the ship was felt to be an absolute guarantee against any marauding German raider. This claim of neutral immunity by the British appeared extremely hypocritical to the Germans, who were being blockaded by the Royal Navy and starved of all imports. To fight back, Tirpitz resorted to his submarines, and in February of 1915, declared the waters around the British Isles a war zone, stating that all ships would be deemed fair targets and passengers should travel at their own risk. Cunard and the skipper of the Lusitania, Captain William Turner, scoffed at these threats, secure in their belief that the Lusitania was not only fast enough to outrun any U-boat, but also that the Germans would never dare shoot at them. On May 1st, 1915, Lusitania began her 202nd crossing. The voyage was marked by rumors that the Germans were to sink the ship, but again, Turner denied any validity to these claims by reminding the public of his ship's great speed. Nevertheless, the trip was uneventful for the unsuspecting passengers, who enjoyed Lusitania's luxuries. Meanwhile, U-20, skippered by Captain Lieutenant de Walter Schweiger, had been cruising for several days around the British Isles. He had seen some success on his mission, but also torpedo trouble that was the source of much frustration to him. By May 7th, he was running out of fuel and decided to turn about and head for home. Simultaneously, RMS Lusitania had finally reached the coast of Ireland. This was a welcome sight for the passengers and crew alike, grateful that the danger was now in their minds over. Fog crept in throughout the morning of the 7th, and Turner subsequently reduced his speed to 15 knots. By noon, the murk had cleared, and Lusitania's skipper brought her engines back up to 18 knots. Surfacing at 12.45 hours, U-20's lookouts enjoyed dramatically improved visibility. At 13.20 hours, Schweiger was summoned to the conning tower by his watch officer, who had sighted an enormous vessel. Closing range, 
Schweiger's officers concurred that the ship was probably Lusitania, who was listed as an armed merchant cruiser. The prize was slipping through his fingers, however, as the great ship turned away just as the wily captain had managed to close the distance to two miles. It was at this moment that Turner eased his ship back, setting in for a new course. This maneuver set up a perfect shot for Schweiger, who fired one torpedo at the liner at 14.10 hours. Deckhand Leslie Morton was patrolling his post when he spotted an object in the water rapidly approaching the Lusitania, producing a large white wake. Immediately he yelled to the bridge, informing them of what he believed were two torpedoes incoming. In reality there was only one, and his warning came too late. Striking Lusitania almost directly beneath her bridge, the initial hit was not noticed by everyone. Moments later, a massive secondary explosion ripped through the vessel, something felt by almost all aboard. The severity of the situation became rapidly apparent as Lusitania developed a significant list to starboard, while her bow lowered towards the water. At 14.12 hours, Captain Turner ordered the helmsman to steer toward the coast of Ireland, hoping he could beach his ship. This move in reality only worsened Lusitania's delicate condition, accelerating the flooding as the mighty turbines drove the ship toward the bottom. A distress call went out and was quickly acknowledged by coastal authorities. This proved to be extremely lucky, as power went out only seconds after. Turner then gave the order to abandon ship, and by this point, Lusitania had developed a 15-degree list to starboard. The loss of power meant that all those below decks were now completely covered in darkness, and most would be unable to find their way out in time. People in elevators became trapped, facing the horrific fate of being drowned in a cage. The situation wasn't much better topside, as the list now prevented the port side lifeboats from being launched only giving passengers access to lifeboats on the starboard side. It was only 10 minutes after being hit by the torpedo that Lusitania had slowed enough to begin launching her boats. But however, the list continued to cause complications, swinging the boats out too far, preventing passengers from boarding. Chaos ensued as the panicked crew tried to evacuate the people as fast as they could, but this only resulted in many boats tipping as they were lowered, dumping their passengers into the freezing Irish Sea. Only six boats were successfully launched, and any others that managed to make it off did so by floating off the deck as the ship sank. By this point, Lusitania was in her death throes, and Turner, determined to go down with his ship, went under with the bridge. The stern rose somewhat into the air before settling back as the ship gently slid beneath the waves, sending hundreds into the cold water. Eighteen minutes after being torpedoed, Lusitania was gone. The survivors drifted about in the overcrowded boats, while the others who were in the water cried for help. Slowly, inevitably, their screams disappeared, and the water was silent. Most had perished from hypothermia, brought about by the frigid temperatures of the Irish Sea. Despite having gotten off the message that they were in trouble, help did not arrive for several hours. When all was said and done, 1,195 men, women, and children had been lost. The news was met with outrage throughout the world. The British could not believe that the Germans would attack a neutral unarmed passenger ship and immediately began campaigning the U.S. to use the incident as justification for their entry into the war. Indeed, 128 Americans had died when Lusitania sank, turning American attitudes towards Germany decidedly sour. President Wilson wept when he learned of the disaster, but ultimately still chose peace over violence, instead writing a letter of protest to the Kaiser telling him that if such attacks continued, he would be forced to take action. The Germans tried to defend their actions by pointing out the hypocrisy being exhibited by the British and that Lusitania was listed as an armed merchant cruiser in official recognition books, but their argument fell on deaf ears. The Kaiser, fearing American entry into the war, ordered his U-boats to end the unrestricted warfare campaign, much to Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz's frustration, who ultimately resigned over the issue. The sinking of RMS Lusitania had far-reaching consequences for the world. It brought an end to the long-held belief that war could be a civilized and gentlemanly affair that respected rules and neutrality. Though many have debated over whether the ship was carrying illegal contraband, ultimately the blame game leads nowhere, as it often does when historians discuss the First World War. The true legacy of Lusitania is that of the innocent passengers that were lost with her, who were merely caught up in something far larger than they could ever know. Their memory shall forever remain entombed with the wreck of the liner, which after 105 years still rests on the sandy bottom of the Irish Sea.
Thank you so much for watching. If you have a suggestion for a future video, please leave it in the comments below.